Great experiences build great leaders. Great leaders build great teams. This is Building Great Sales Teams. All right, guys, if you're if you're smiling, then we're in good shape. Welcome back to the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. I've got my friend and the owner and CEO of Delta Solar here today. He's been in the solar industry for eight years now. He started back in 2015, and he has since opened up his own company three years ago, Delta Solar. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me, dude. This is a, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Absolutely. Um, I'll man. just say it. It's my first podcast, so. Pop in your podcast, <clears throat> Sherry. I've, I've had a few uh, podcast cherries popped in my time, you know, and so um, I'm going to keep that going. <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. On that. Uh, yeah, it's an enclosed trailer. I'm feeling really weird right now. Vulnerable. So. <laughs> Vulnerable. Vulnerable. <laughs> okay, it's two on one. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Let's actually be productive here today. So, man, how did we meet? It was, was it just on social media? Was it just on Facebook? So, we were connected there? It, it's kind of actually funny, and I don't know if you remember it, but mm-hmm. I reached out through Facebook Messenger yes, because I I'm just that guy. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you really understood what I was trying to meet for. Uh-huh. I think I typed up very vague, like, hey, dude, I think we should meet. We're both in San Antonio, both in sales. Yeah. We should probably link up. Yeah. Me didn't know too much about what you did. Okay. Instantly recruiting mode. Okay. You at the time were still, you know, doing the, the solar sales stuff and mm-hmm. you're running a couple of crews, yeah. um, and a couple of sales orgs. So um, I think maybe you on some low key thing thought, awesome, I'm going to talk to this guy and see what he's about. Maybe I'm recruiting him. Right. Initially, we were both talking as if we were recruiting each other. <laughs> and I don't think we, I, I, I realized it very soon on. I was like, hey, so... I don't think we're recruitable to each other. And then yeah. that's when the conversation got more interesting because we're just like, our guards fell down a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And we're just like, okay, yeah, we, we obviously can't recruit each other. <laughs> well, I I think you had Delta rolling already. Yeah. So it was, you know, and it, I think that was right after I joined APEC. So I was really investing in social media and that's probably yes. what caught your eye. And uh, you had I a buddy with you too. Wayne? No, or, um, another guy, I forgot his name. Um, <clears throat> Jose. Yeah. Jose Lopez. Yeah. Yeah. So funny story, just to kind of like how this all happened and what an abundance mindset can do. So Jose Lopez is actually in Apex with me. Oh, nice. And he decided he wanted to get into solar. He, he had a door-to-door sales company and uh, he had a, a fairly large organization under another organization, kind of like a Sitcor type model stuff. Okay. And, uh, and he wanted to get into solar and he was very mobile at that time, him and his wife. And I was like, well, come down to San Antonio, stay at an Airbnb or whatever, and work out of my office for a little while, work with my guys and see what it's all about. You know what I mean? Then yeah. go back up to Chicago and do your thing. You know what I mean? So he was basically doing research into running a, a, a solar org, which at the time we were rolling. We were doing like 15, 20 a month. And and so he got to see that and learn from that. And now he's doing the same thing up in Chicago. Yeah, it's, uh, well, that's freaking awesome for him, yeah. man. I, I, again, like, when we first met, I really was like, yeah, I'm going to go to lunch with this guy and I'm going to see what he's about. And mm-hmm. I think I'm probably going to recruit him. <laughs> that was my mentality, like rolling yeah. into lunch. I was just like, yeah, this is what's going to go down today. And Not I realized, knowing. yeah, this guy, yeah, no. <laughs> Not, I don't own my own sales work since 2011. <laughs> yeah. So, I was, you know, again, you know, guys like us, we yeah. kind of get that confidence and we kind of yeah. just have that aura about us. Like, mm-hmm. hey, we can talk to anybody and build yeah, a vision absolutely. and stuff. But yeah, it was just very interesting to me being in sales for so long in San Antonio. It's a small community, so to like yeah. hear of someone else within city limits or even ten miles or so right. outside of city limits that's doing sales and doing exactly what we're doing, I was like, I I have to meet you. Yeah, like you know, so yeah, it's crazy because when you look at door to door in general, and this is you know outside of solar, like in cable, you know, which was bigger pre two thousand fifteen, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Um, it, it, it wasn't like that. You know, we had Ray here on the podcast earlier just before you, and we were talking about that abundance mindset of just being able to share. And I, I could not do that back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. basically when I shared something or I shared something about my team, people use it against me to recruit 
my people. And it, and it, it, it happened more time than one that either like a whole office got recruited away or a key player got recruited away, whatever the case was. And I was very early on in the game, so I didn't understand culture and retention and all that type of stuff. It was very much about scaling and numbers, you know. And uh, But when you found me, it was like I was in Apex. I already had multiple divisions that I was yes. operating. So it was very much like, hey, you know, uh, that abundance mindset where it's like, hey, if we can learn something from each other, great. You know what I mean? I think we had talked about having you come in and speak to my team mm-hmm. and me going and speaking to your team. Exactly. That whole deal. And then, uh, of course, everything went south for me and Solar after that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just one of those things where um, I wasn't in the market that my team was operating. You know what I mean? But anyways, uh, and then I went full-time consulting last year. And we had still been following each other, liking each other's posts, supporting Which, each other. Which, by the way, congratulations on that, man. That's it's kind of a hard market to break into. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Yeah, you know, and it's funny. Everybody that's from that I know from door to door says, oh, you're consulting door to door teams. It's like I only have one door to door team that I consult right now. The other eight are different yeah. industries and, in, you know, B2B or uh, B2C, but telemarketing, like all different industries is, is how it's working out because of because of the network and everything. And so uh, you reached out again and you're like, hey, uh, what did you reach out for this time? Um, for you to come, because once I saw that you were going into consulting, uh-huh. Right. And back then it's always like, uh, yeah. I don't know if I want to like have this guy talk to my guy. Right. Or right. Yeah. Um, immediately I was just like, okay, well let's, let's have him come talk to our guys. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it was just over just sales in general growth. Yeah. I, um, you know, you told your rattlesnake story about yeah. death. Um, so, so that, that was re- initially why I reached out the second time was to just have you come in and just, Hey guys, here's another guy in the San Antonio market that's doing sales mm-hmm. and, uh, he's built great sales team. So let's give him a listen. Yeah, absolutely. Got to put my watch on. Do not disturb. Jeez, I'm getting lit up. <laughs> um, no, 100%. And it was a great experience. And, you know, I think I had posted, like, I'm trying to get reps right now. You know what right. I mean? Like, if you want me to come speak to your team, come speak to your team. And I think you and I talked before, and it was like, all right, do I want to go in there and, like, hit them on sales like they get hit on every day? Or do I want right. to give them something to think about, something to chew on, you know? And so uh, I really enjoyed it. You got a great team. Thank you. Great thing happening for you guys. Uh, brand new office. You guys are expanding. So. Yes. And uh, bringing door to door back to solar. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really the best way to sell it at this Hell point. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. No, I mean, just uh, obviously everybody's jumping on the virtual trend and stuff like that. Yeah. And while I do believe in that as a scalable model, you know what I mean? I just know that those door to door sales are stickier when you're in the, in the home with the 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 consumer so yeah okay so has it you, you know you're you're around my age right are you younger maybe like uh, i'll be younger? 38 this year oh shit Where's august 15th age? if anyone wants to get me a birthday card or send one um <laughs> or a gift card or whatever a gift um, i accept august, everything august 15th august 15th all right i think we no you're september right Okay, I'm going to remember his birthday someday. <laughs> I put everything in my calendar so I don't have to remember, right. but I work with Ryan every day. so I I'll be 38 this year. Nice. How old are you? So, uh, 30, 36. Okay. 36. I'm about to turn 37 in April. Okay. So, April 26, if anybody wants to get me a birthday card. Get him April again. 26. <laughs> That's right around the corner, man. Absolutely. So, what did you do before solar? Uh, did alarms. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's always been door to door. Um, so I started off as actually as a technician. Okay. In alarms, cool. and um, I slowly, actually no, not slowly. Um, I was a technician for a long time in alarms, mm-hmm. um, and then I just got tired of getting home at like midnight, one o'clock, crossing state lines. Yeah. You know, having to do an install over here, over there, traveling for like a couple of years doing that. Mm-hmm. It's got old, and we always ran summer sales programs. So yeah. You know, seeing the uh, other sales reps or uh, the alarm reps in the hot tub or in the swimming pool or they were doing, like, the fun outings yeah. while we were installing them. I was like, dude, there, there's got to be a better way. I can't do this forever. Mm-hmm. So I got kind of talked into doing sales, and that's what led me into my transition into the sales side. 
So did you have a lot of success in alarms at first before you transitioned to solar? Oh, no, I was horrible. <laughs> I, I, no, like 100% I was horrible. I mean, okay. I mean, as a technician, like, I was very good. I knew exactly what to do, like, you know, red wire, black wire. Like, it, it was yeah. pretty – these were wireless, too, so it wasn't like back in the day where, oh, yeah. you know, you had to, like, you know, hard wire in connects. 24 yeah. zones on a house. So, um, you know, like, I uh, honestly, like, I blew through a lot of savings and stuff just to keep my level of lifestyle up that I had developed okay. as a technician in sales i think like my first year i probably like made like 10 grand in alarm sales because i knew too much i was the typical show up and throw up like yeah. they, they asked for the motion detector i was like yeah it works and so i just gave them too many options too much to think about mm -hmm. and i just wasn't listening to anything anyone any advice people were giving me mm -hmm. because i thought i knew it all i was a technician i knew more than of the alarm system than they did yeah right and so Absolutely. i learned the hard way i learned the hard way and so then i started following people's advice, attending the sales trainings, mm -hmm. going to the sales meetings, working with people that were doing better than me. Yeah. Right. And slowly. That knew so much less. That knew so much <laughs> less. Right. So, um, it, yeah, I definitely fell flat on my face my first year. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you look at buying styles, uh, the detective is one of the hardest by our selling style to make it into a good salesperson. Yeah. Like you said, they know too much or they want to know too much instead of just following the training, Bingo. following the script, executing, getting the reps, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And so much of uh, th that proves it right there. You can know everything about the product possible, which you do need to have a healthy knowledge, right? You do. When you encounter somebody that has a buying, uh, that's their buying style as detective. But you can basically, like you said, show up and throw up. And, you can. And you can almost chips. talk yourself out of a deal, which I did plenty of times. Oh, I did too. I did too. <laughs> you know, it's it, it's funny. So much more of my sales skills revolve around recruiting, very similar to you. And um, I did that to myself all the time. I was like, this is the training process we have. This is every step in the training process. This is what you can make. And this is different versions of what you can make if you sell right. this kind of product and everything. And at the end of the day, they just wanted to know that somebody else in the company was doing what I said that we could do. Yeah. You know what I mean? So all I had to do was bring in those examples and they were sold. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and that whole engagement person to person, the uh, emotional side of sales, where the money's at. Exactly. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Totally emotional sale. So by the time you transitioned to solar, had you cut your teeth a little bit in alarm sales and yeah. had some success? Yeah. Um, uh, I had moved around the country. Mm -hmm. um, I helped start um, a couple solar, um, oh, I'm sorry, um, alarm organizations. Okay. Um, one of which is still running in Louisiana. Very cool. Um, so um, along the way, though, I had been offered and talked to about moving out to California in 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. And even 2014 when solar was starting when solar was starting and that's yeah. when you had like the tesla the solar or i'm sorry solar city mm -hmm. right you know you had complete solar at the time and, and some other big players dude solar city is like uh so on the cable side solar city is like like the sick core of solar right and right. then and then i would say uh with a large it's probably like vivant maybe yeah you know so yeah, no, definitely know what you're saying. Everybody that's somebody came from Solar City. Yeah, and, yeah. and and honestly, anyone that's somebody right now, I truly believe, came from the alarm world mm -hmm. and solar. I, I would say about like ninety percent, probably in like right. the industry. Then we need to go way back, and then before that, they came from Argenta. Yeah, there you go. Because <laughs> it was cable before that, right? Yeah, I, I never got the opportunity to do cable. Yeah. So, but um, but yeah, I just. I was just like, I'm not going to move to California. I already moved across the country. I already yeah. was traveling a lot. I, I was done with it. Um, so San Antonio came to, or I'm sorry, solar came to San Antonio finally in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And there was a door to door model. So I just jumped in feet first. Nice. Very nice. And uh, so I'm guessing you worked your way through the ranks there. Yeah, there's a series of events that happened mm -hmm. um, for me to kind of like move up through the ranks. I mean, uh, <clears throat> people always joked with me in the alarm world, you know, you know, uh, the be back bus never comes back in alarms, right? Like if you're not selling them that day, like going back is not really going right, to happen. Of course. Um, but I was always the one that was following up. So when mm -hmm. I went into solar, my follow up game was very strong in solar because mm -hmm. for some reason I just had developed that in alarms, which isn't your typical way of doing things in alarms as far as door to door goes. So, um, I got pretty good at solar, mm -hmm. uh, and through a series of events led me to managing the San Antonio office within a matter of like six months. Nice. And then um, I went to go help a buddy of mine build his organization. Um, 
at a time when red lines and dealer models weren't even talked about it. You had to like work at a big organization yeah. to um, sell solar. To get into solar. To yeah, get into solar. Sense. But um, he had figured out a way to start a dealer and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that and mentioned the word red line. And you know, I was like, okay. Like, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. I create my own profit. Right. Um, helped uh, manage um, on, on some mid and high levels. Um, several other organizations helped build um, another uh, organization as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that ultimately everything that has led me to where I am now um, is why I started what I started because it's just been a progression mm-hmm. of, at this point, a career. So in, in working with and for those different companies, um, what did you recognize was, okay, this is what works and this is what doesn't? Door-to-door clearly works. Mm-hmm. I mean, after being in door-to-door for so long, like you, you just can't get past it. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. It doesn't matter uh, what region you're in, what city you're in, like door-to-door just works. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if you have the work ethic and drive. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that works is a well-built company processes, mm-hmm. right? Um, I've, I learned very early on by a lot of mentors that I had mm-hmm. um, going through this process. Um, you don't manage people, you manage processes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So um, being able to build out processes um, is, is key. Mm-hmm. Even if you don't have any, build out one. Like just have one process. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. Just have yeah. one, at least something. And that'll be the most efficient part of your company. <laughs> exactly. You know, so um, again, you know, just, just learning little tidbits from a lot of mentors that I've had in the industry mm-hmm. um, has led me to, you know, doing what I do. Let me ask you this. Your company now, what was the first thing that you systemized? <sighs> Man, there was just like a lot going on back there. Um, mm-hmm. I would say uh, payroll. Payroll? Okay. Because that was probably the number one complaint at the other companies, right? A hundred percent reps didn't know what they were getting paid. Um, EPCs not, um, being upfront with what they need to charge. Mm -hmm. Um, so payroll. Yeah. No. Um, I would say that was a big part of the success of our company, you know, in different campaigns. And so it was really about not forcing the client, but structuring the compensation so that there was room for, mistakes on the clients in right um there wasn't really room for mistakes on our staffs in, and if they did happen like we were very transparent about it you know what i'm saying and so you know as long as we weren't putting anybody in the poorhouse and a mistake was (laughs) happened we were able to remedy it pretty quickly and the beautiful thing about what we did is and it bit us in the butt sometimes too because you know we all we had systems set up to where okay you could view your payroll on wednesday Right. You could submit corrections by Thursday, and then if they were valid corrections, we would reflect them by Friday, and then maybe you'd get paid the following Monday. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the system was in place so that it went through all these filters and until you agreed twice, basically, that your payroll was correct, and then you were finally getting that on Monday. Right. You know? Now, reps still were surprised on Monday sometimes. Of course. Because they never course. logged into their Or they never staff. fully understood, or there wasn't proper expectations set. Yeah. Um, about payroll in general, like this is what you get charged for, or this is the potentials that could happen as to mm-hmm. why you might get paid really low. You know, uh, I, I truly believe reps hear what they want to hear sometimes. So, well, and that's why we put it in writing. Right. So like on one of their take home packets, we always put uh, a payroll explanation. Yeah. So it's like the timing of payroll, the process, you know what I mean? And then things to watch out for. A hundred percent. I mean, and so that would always kind of increase the, the clarity when it comes to payroll. But, uh, I guess where was it more that you saw that as an issue in the past or like it was a pain point for you as a rep? I, I, I think it's a pain point in industry, in mm-hmm. any industry that you're in, in door to door, you know, you, you go out there, you know, you work hard. I mean, Bust ass. Am I allowed to cuss on this podcast? Yeah, hell okay, yeah. Hell yeah. There's, uh, an e, there's an E next to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you go out there and bust ass and then to uh-huh. be told you're only going to get paid this can be a little bit detrimental. And then it's yeah. even harder being up in, in our position. Right. Right. As like, well, dude, like we, we said that and it was in writing. Or, yeah. You know, we explained this like in the several, mm-hmm. you know, hundreds of meetings that we've had. But it's happened a certain way in their head. So that's reality. Exactly. Yeah. And then now once they learn... And, and, and unfortunately that's, that's the industry or, or that's the, 
I shouldn't say the industry. I should just say there's there's certain things that once a sales rep learns mm-hmm. monetary wise, yeah, they'll never forget it, and then they'll make sure that never happens again. Hell yeah, you know. Yeah. So sometimes you do have to learn that way, mm-hmm. especially if you're the kind of person that doesn't really like listen. You know, and and again, a lot of it's expectations. So taking extreme ownership, you know, mm-hmm. people in our position, we have to be clear about our intentions, be clear about what we're telling reps and how they're going to get paid. And like yeah. you said, like with your organization, you had these things built out, yeah. you know, and, and almost harp on them to beating a dead horse point. Mm-hmm. Because that is always the truest point of contention in any sales organizations. It always comes down to payroll. Hell yeah. I didn't get paid what I was going to expect. Mm-hmm. Right. You told me it was going to be different. So, um, and trust me, I've learned the hard way, yeah. like a hundred percent. I fell on my face, had to take extreme ownership. I've had those conversations with representatives that just mm-hmm. don't understand it or get it. And, and on some level, then you have to just like pay out just to like yeah. keep, you know, keep some level keep of peace, keep the peace, you know? So, you know, it costs thousands of dollars for just ha- setting the wrong expectation. Yeah. If you don't set the right expectation, it literally costs you thousands of dollars. So getting solar specific, what are some of the things that that you have to do because you know i i know what it can be like dealing with dpcs right and something goes sideways on a deal and they want you to pay for everything even though you can trace it back to you know it's on their end whatever the case is so what are some of the things that you put in place in order to one have time to mitigate those things or to make sure that they understand hey i can dictate things this way too you know what i'm saying um I think there's a lot of different schools of thought on this. I think it ultimately comes down to the relationship you have with the EPC. Mm -hmm. And again, people are probably gonna be like, Casey, you're freaking wrong. Like that's not a way to deal with it or whatever. But you know, this is the way I've dealt with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I, on some level, you do have to take responsibility as a sales org. Okay. Even if the EPC, you know, they're wrong. Yeah. You have to take responsibility. Because it really doesn't matter what the EPC says or what they're going to dictate. What really matters is what comes down to the client. So on some level, whether or not they held pay because the client called into them and said, hey, you know, we're, you know, we were told this by our sales rep and the EPC decides to pay it out yeah, and then hold it back from your pay because one of your reps said that. Like, you, like you got to. Oh, absolutely. You know, you, yeah. you, you can fight with them all you want. Right. Or if, uh, you know, they charge you too much for an electrical upgrade or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, adders, you know, we'll just call it. Yeah. Um, you have to take extreme ownership in that because maybe you should have known more about the electrical process if you're going to get in bed with an EPC. Otherwise, do your own installs. Yeah. So um, on some level, like there is that like, no, they're the EPC. We should have talked about this. Well, yeah, but why didn't you bring it up in the first place? Mm -hmm. And so if you open yourself up to be treated like that, then you do. But there is you can go back and restructure. Right. which I think a lot of people don't do. They don't go back and say, okay, we've already made five mistakes with this EPC. Yeah. It's cost us $15,000. Right. We need to now go into the EPC and have a meeting. And I think that's yeah. where people, they just don't, would rather not deal with it. Mm-hmm. And so then they just go find another like, EPC. Yeah. Right. And, and, and EPCs are not a dime a dozen. <laughs> you know They're not. Saying? And not the good ones anyways. Well, at least not in today's environment, mm-hmm. in the last like two years. I, I went through five in six months before I got to the one that I was using at the end. And even the one that I was using at the end, it's like, you know, because of location and everything, they were subbing, subbing to another group of installers and that group ended up and this is just some of the things that can happen in solar. So they were subbing to another install group, right? Which is, if you think about it, you've got your journeyman and you've got the actual guys on the roof and everything. And then you got your helper and, uh, they were, they were doing the site surveys and they were basically saying that every customer needed a panel upgrade. Oh yeah. So they can get that work. Right. You know what I mean? And before we realized it, because we had, you know, uh, a different crew installing this over here that wasn't having any upgrades in this one, like 50% of their homes were like, what's going on here? Like, wait a second. (laughs) But we didn't know the difference because it was one company to us, you know what I'm saying? And then finally we we retracted down because we were local. Right. Mm-hmm. And we were able to converse with this other group and realize, hey, they're they're not submitting for any panel upgrades. There's something going on over here. Right. And by the time we went and backtracked everything, you know, we had to pay for four panel upgrades at twenty five hundred dollars a pop. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you know, luckily that that was all by one sales rep. 
You know what I mean? So it was easy to pinpoint. Yeah, it was easy to pinpoint. And um, they were obviously, they understood what happened. You know what I mean? They understood, hey, company's coming out of pocket on this. Right. You know, so they, I think they came out like 750 per deal. And we came out the rest. You know yeah. what I'm saying? See, that's a great relationship to have. You know, I've had EPCs like that. They're like, hey, let's split the difference. Mm-hmm. You know, but you got to have those relationships. Yeah. A lot of people, they just go get what they want mm-hmm. and not realize the long term. Six months in, what happens when this deal happens? If you so, don't have those relationships, then it's going to be real yeah. clear, concise what the EPC needs to do mm-hmm. as a business because their name's on the install agreement. Yeah. And then that's one of the things I always respected, which is why I was willing to split the difference very often yeah. because I knew, hey, this was controllable. But at the same time, it's like, damn. I don't, I don't have a system for everything. I don't have right. a fail safe for everything. You know what right. I mean? This is one of those things that isn't consistent. So let's split the difference and move on. Yeah. You know? and, and as a sales org, you have to understand you don't have total control. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people go, you know, well, you're the owner of the sales org or this or that. Mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, we all have people we have to report to. 100%. Right? Yeah. And as a sales org, it's the EPC. Yeah. No, and then and then your salespeople. Well, yeah, ultimately your salespeople, but <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, we always have that higher person that we have right. to report to on some level. One hundred percent. So, you guys are in San Antonio. You've got some satellite reps too. Um, we're in San Antonio exclusively right okay. now, but um, you know, we kind of uh, dialed things back to San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Um, but twenty twenty three, we're looking to expand um, okay. a lot more. What's the? I guess what's the expansion plan, or what's the What's the next step for you in your business? <clears throat> um, probably 10x growth. Mm-hmm. Um, I truly feel that if we don't 10x growth by the end of 2023, or let's say anyone, mm-hmm. any sales organization that's um, city specific or regional yeah. right now, or even state, um, I truly f- feel that they need a 10x growth mm-hmm. um, to be able to weather any storms that may or co- may start coming mm-hmm. by the end of this year or next year. Um, what am I talking about? Maybe solar regulation that starts coming down on on sales reps. Um, no, maybe, brother. Yeah, it's coming. It's, it's, it's coming. It's, it's not a matter of uh, if, when, mm-hmm. right? Um, also, you know, in our in our climate of of just economics right now, mm-hmm. right? Being able to have that growth and cash flow to be able to fund any new ventures or just stay in business. Yeah. You know, so, um, but it's also scary too, right? Cause 10 X and growth costs money. Yeah. I mean, here, here's a thought though. If you 10 X growth, do you have the capital now to start your own EPC or install your own deals? Uh, no, no, Not still, no. it's still, it's still tough. So, but I will say this, I'm doing it in a more dynamic way. Okay. So I'll actually just launch it right now. Should okay. I just launch it? You launch it. Launch it. So, Let's go. Um, so Delta Solar Power, um, there's a whole marketing campaign that we're doing. Um, okay. But I'll launch it. This is my first podcast, man. Yeah, hell yeah. Might as well. Um, 7323, the road to independence. Okay. So we are heading down a road to do our own installs. Okay. By July 4th, which is Independence Day. Oh, I love that. So 7323, the road to independence. That's what we're launching. Okay. So now it's officially launched. <laughs> now now we have to make it happen. Yeah, now you have to make it happen. Now we have to make it happen. There's something to be said about that. You know, whenever, um, yeah, I do it all the time. You know, I, I posted uh, probably April of last year that I was going to run a marathon mm-hmm. on my social media in October. And, um, well, I didn't run it in October. I ran it in November. <laughs> But I still ran it nonetheless because I knew I had people I was accountable to, not just my family. Obviously, right. that's the most important. And I want to set an example for them. Well, first off, they knew, right? Once you put it out there, it's got to happen now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, hey, we didn't get where we are by not following through. <sighs> yeah, or just like, you know, sidelining our, our visions or mm-hmm. goals. So um, it's a scary thing, but that's that's what we have planned. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think we're doing it in a more dynamic way than most people think that it has to be done, Mm -hmm. which I feel will make us successful at doing it. Are we going to TM that trademark? Uh, Oh, 7323 road to independence. No, uh, the dynamic way that you're going to be doing the installs. Um, Maybe. Cause that's dynamic is a sexy word. It is. So we better see something sexy come July. Yeah. (laughs) There's going to be something sexy in July. (laughs) 
Besides Casey in the bathing suit? Exactly, or a Speedo. <laughs> or a Speedo. Oh, man, I love it. <laughs> All right, let's get a little tactical here for, I guess, anybody that has a sales team. You know, you've got a lot of experience in recruiting, building, and managing salespeople. You have a few tips you can give these people? Um, man, there's just there's a lot that comes to mind, but top of mind uh <clears throat> don't be scared i would say um if you're going to start recruiting come up with a chicken list first okay What's um I, I've, I've always been told this and it's always worked um in my opinion from everything i've done with recruiting um a chicken list is top five people that um you're too scared to recruit that maybe would would never take the opportunity would never uh you, you wouldn't think that they would do it or you don't even want to talk to them about the opportunity because you're not sure of yourself. Um, so I, I think having a chicken list first and foremost before you start recruiting is, is is probably like the top thing that you want to do if you're recruiting. Is that how you got your VP of sales? Did you put him on a chicken list? I actually met him at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, Stop. I did. <laughs> met him at a Chick-fil-A. Met him at a Chick-fil-A. So Just randomly? Ch- chicken list, Chick-fil-A. You know, obviously there's something there. Yeah, randomly. Randomly. Wow randomly so no i love the advice though i mean because you know so i'm i'm in apex and one of the the courses in apex that you get whenever you join is called building your machine and in that course you identify 25 people and it's called your dream 25 these are people that you want to do business with right right so you start targeting them on social media you start liking their posts sharing their stuff commenting on their stuff and then they See your stuff. Eventually, they're going to hit you up and be like, hey, dude, you've been yeah. liking every post since yeah. August. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not everyone. But, right. <laughs> you know, you put them on your favorites or whatever. Anyways, the the concept is, you know, that if y'all are aligned, that they're going to do business with you eventually or because they're your top of mind, you're going to do business with them. So I, I love the idea of, of starting with the end in mind. It's like th- this is the avatar of the five people I want to recruit. Right. And you, you go after those specific people, but probably what's going to happen in the process is you're going to capture a lot of other people yep. just in that. You know what I mean? Exactly. So I love that. What about, um, I guess, managing salespeople? Any advice there? Um, set the expectations early on. Mm-hmm. That's the best thing I can say is it doesn't matter what you're doing, if it's door-to-door, if it's call center, whatever, setting that expectation of what the job actually entails to the point, like even just from a recruiting standpoint, just to the point of like, you're almost scaring them away from the job. Hell yeah. Like, cause you, you understand what the job entails and mm-hmm. you sh- it's your responsibility to tell them exactly what it's going to be like. And then as far as managing people, yeah, if you set the right expectations and managing them should be um, pretty easy. But to go further, if you're managing guys, it's been like six months now and you're like, oh, man, like it's just not going right for me. Um, I would say be flexible and know when to pivot. Okay. Um, Don't be too set in your ways. People think that automatically, well, no, I have this in my mind. This needs to happen this way. I'm managing these 10 people and, you know, we need to get here. I mean, be flexible Mm -hmm. um, in the fact of like listen to your sales team. Yeah. They'll literally tell you exactly what they don't want to do and what they want to do and what they like and what they don't like, what incentives they care for, what incentives they don't care for. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a client, right? You go into discovery mode and instead of just doing the same pitch over and over again, you know, ask them questions and they'll give you the keys of the kingdom as to why maybe they haven't gone solar or why they want to go solar and they haven't yet. Mm -hmm. Um, Same thing with your sales org. Um, You know, if, if, if you listen to them, they'll literally tell you how they should be managed. But it's still tough. It's it's yeah. still tough because from a business owner's yeah. mindset, you're like, oh, we still got to do that. Yeah. Do this. I mean, as long as you're staying on your mission and your right. core values, you're going to be fine. Exactly. You know, um, we pivoted from AT&T U-verse to DirecTV. You know what I'm saying? The commission was higher. Uh, my guys were getting recruited away. It's what they wanted. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes that has to happen. But we still believed in achieving freedom. We still had our core values intact. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And... Um, Turns out when you pivot like that, you'll often immediately find out if that was the right decision. So when I did that, I actually gave AT&T a three month notice that oh, I was nice. going to be pivoting to DirecTV. They took my leads away right away. 
Yeah. And so I knew right. I was like, I'm making the right decision because they don't give a shit about me. You know what I mean? If they didn't, then they wouldn't have pulled our leads. Because right. one day in door to door at that time was shoot like 20, 30 grand. You know what I'm saying? And so the, I, anyways, just to illustrate, yeah. <laughs> illustrate your point, we pivoted and um, we, we were better for it. But no, I think everything, everything in life is that structure, you know, where you intro, qualifier, discovery, as you called it, then then the presentation based on the qualifier discovery. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then at some point, you know, the way you said earlier about trying to scare them out of the position, I think it's incredibly important because many people run opportunity meetings or they run interviews and it's all good, good, positive, positive. They don't give them the negative. Right? Yeah, exactly. The negative is you closing the deal with the customer, but you're doing it with a recruit instead. And instead of them paying your money, they're paying you with their time. And hey, if you give me your time, you're either going to get this or, you know, if you don't execute properly or if you have a bad day, you may get this. Right. You know what I mean? And one of those things is working at 100 degree heat, getting... Especially in San Antonio. Door slammed yeah. in your face, getting a gun pulled on you, having a dog chase after you. Yeah. That's the reality. Cops called on you. Cops called. Yep. Yeah. People yelling at you like... We, yeah. literally, we literally had that in our script for the one-on-one. So we would do one-on-ones after the opportunity meeting. Oh. And we would sit them down one-on-one. And they could ask the scary questions, you know what I'm saying, where it wasn't in a big group. They didn't, they didn't seem, like, weak or something. So <laughs> so I, I I learned this early on. So one thing that we do and one mm-hmm. thing I've always done is anyone that comes into our organization, as soon as they come in, whether it's from Indeed, Craigslist, or, yeah. you know, they find you on Facebook or you reach right. out to them or it's like a, a friend. It's the same um, system. Um I pretty much asked them, I go, do you have like an hour? Like right now? They mm-hmm. go, yeah, why? Okay, cool. Like you look fine with what you're wearing. I'm going to go have you follow this guy today and see if you actually like door to door. I actually, a long time ago, um, one of the first sales jobs I had was selling, um, let's call it blue chip, um, uh, blue chip products to uh, businesses door to door. Okay. And uh, it was like, it was like these things from like Disney or, NASCAR mm-hmm. or something like that or high quality at this you know I didn't know Costco at the time so it was like probably nice what leather jackets you would buy from Costco or purses I don't know it was just this company that sold a random bunch of things and they literally told me well go door to door and and you're gonna go with this guy today and it's gonna it's gonna take up four hours yeah but but we'll know if if you're actually legit like trying to do this job the first hour I was like nope I, I can't do this there's yeah. just like no way and I told the guy, he took me to lunch, and I remember sitting there, and I was like, hey, man, so I'm not going to lie. I, I haven't had fun today at all, and I, <laughs> I don't see myself doing this. He's like, yeah. well, cool. And we're we're actually here, like, downtown by SAC, mm-hmm. um, uh, San Antonio Community College, and he, he bought me a burger. I was young. I was, like, 19 yeah. years old, so, like, right out of high school. And um, I remember him telling me, like, looking me dead in the eye. He's like, that's fine. He goes, you kind of been to, like, you know, a drag anyways. You've been kind of, like, slowing me down. Yeah. Um, so um, lunch is on me, but um, I know you rode out with me. You just got to find your own way back to the office. <laughs> and I was like, okay, fair enough. There was no Uber back then. Yeah. You know, and so uh, nice. I, had to, I had to call like a cousin of mine. She oh, came, come gotcha. pick me up, and uh, took me back to the office. So ever since then, I was like, this is actually actually pretty good. Like, so now we have people go out mm-hmm. their first interview before yeah. we even hire them. Yeah. Take 30, 45 minutes up to an hour of your day, mm-hmm. however long you can stay out. And if you're willing to do this job, then we'll see you back here tomorrow. Hell yeah. Yeah, I, I always love, we, we called them same day, same day hires. Right. But we wouldn't do any paperwork, we wouldn't do anything. It was like, hey, you're just don't exactly. for a ride along. Yeah. You're an it's like a ride along, exactly. Yeah, you're a ride along yeah. today. And door to door, here's your vest. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we had the vest. Yeah. No, I meant like bulletproof vest because you know. Oh, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the, the orange vest. Oh, no. Yeah, you know? the orange vest. No, yeah. no, no. Hey, hey, we're actually digging up in your backyard right, right now. Right, those guys. You know. yeah. yeah. And they would freak out. The customer would get a little pattern interrupt, and then they would listen. <laughs> yeah, we would do that sometimes. It's fun stuff. All right, brother. So I asked the question at the end of every episode. What does legacy mean to you, and what legacy do you want to leave behind? Um. So... Kind of like Ryan, or I'm sorry, Ray, in the uh, first podcast um, before this one, um, I always thought legacy was financial too. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, like I really thought like having all this money. Yeah. Um, as you get older, you have kids. Mm-hmm. I have a son. He's 10 year old, uh, Lucas. Um, then you start thinking it's about family. 
right? But, man, I, I really think it comes down to impact. Um, and impact in all facets of life. Impact with your family. Like, what kind of family man were you? Mm-hmm. What kind of father were you? Um, and impact in the community. I remember, like, growing up, um, and I know this sounds, like, super cheesy and kind of, like, corny, but I'm here for it. I, I, I honestly thought, you know, after seeing, you know, Rocky, I, I, I truly envisioned at like 10, 11 years old, I was like, dude, that'd be dope to have like a statue of myself mm-hmm. in San Antonio somewhere. Yeah. And then being in San Antonio, what's that mural at uh, Mi Tierra? Has all the most influential people that have had an impact oh, yeah. in San yeah. Antonio or in Southern Texas. I think that's a good goal right there. So, you know, I, as I got older and we'd go to meet the other, like, family coming to yeah. town, I would be like, is there a way to, like, paint my face right in between those two people right there? So, and, and those people had an impact, yeah. right? And so having an impact, like, like right now, Delta Solar Power, we contribute. Um, I, actually, we are uh, involved in several charities mm-hmm. here locally in town that have an impact for school students and um and some other charities that we do uh one of which is ferrari kid the other one is the uh, texas yes project so already we're starting to have an impact at a very let's say infancy stage of our business Mm -hmm. um impact with our individual reps it's not even just about sales it's more about personal development and 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 i've always told people delta solar is just a platform if if for whatever reason in two years we had to shut the doors down to delta solar power because everyone just made so much money that there's no point in us knocking doors anymore because they have investments here and making money over here then that would be the ultimate you know way to go out right um so i i I think it really comes down to impact and like what ray said before right we set the example we set the you know the habits and 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 the culture just for even for our family so like even my son lucas right you know i i used to think having an impact was you know i had to have this business that you know he could you know take over one day or whatever but i don't even think it's about that anymore i think it's about instilling values um instilling um uh an impactful way of how to be a person um so that way he can grow up and start his own delta solar power and not even like take over this one because hopefully you know we're not in business a long time like honestly like i i truly feel like that. i really feel that it would be almost an honor if we can just shut down Delta Solar Power because everyone just made so much money and they're going on, moving on to better, bigger, better things because we had such an impact on them that they actually like listened to the advice that we're giving them, invested in real estate, saved their money, right? You know, like Mm -hmm. did other things and, or or created other businesses. Like imagine if 20 other businesses were created out of Delta Solar Power. Like that's truly what I mean by impact. Like I want to impact people that's not even just like, oh yeah, this person made like a million bucks and they're able to afford the lifestyle that they want. Like, no, like this person actually was able to create five businesses Mm -hmm. because of the stuff that they learned, you know, not only from me, but, you know, our other uh, leaders and stuff like that. Um, And that's what I mean by impact. And so when I use the analogy, like I wish, you know, I had, you know, at 10 years old, there's a Rocky Balboa statue of me, you know, up on the courthouse steps or whatever, right? You know, downtown or, you know, my my face painted at the Mietieta, you know, mural. It's because like, I, I was able to create such an impact, not even just for my family, but like also the community. So I hear a lot of the same things when I ask that question. I gotta say this is the first time that I heard someone say, I want my people to be so successful that my business just shuts down because everybody else is, is doing their own thing now. Yeah. You know what I mean? I have very so, strong convictions about that. Like, no, I, I, like I really want it to happen. The, the Casey that we started the, podcast with and the Casey I'm talking to now are two different guys man he came alive <laughs> at the end there. yeah man you, you you put me in front of a microphone long enough man I'm gonna, I'm gonna start saying some shit <laughs> <laughs> I love it man I love the answer uh, I love the impact that you're gonna create from your son all the way to your business and the people in it so I appreciate you coming on the podcast man man thank you for having me Absolutely. this has been amazing I love it awesome let's get building Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. We really do appreciate it. As you know, we believe that great leaders build great teams. How do you become a great leader? You learn from the greats. Join us at the Million Dollar Mastermind put on by Ryan Stuman in Frisco, Texas, and learn everything that you need to learn to be that great leader. The link will be in the description below. As always, we ask that you like, share, and subscribe wherever you consume podcasts so you can stay up to date with the Building Great Sales Teams podcast. 
Let's get building. <laughs>